uh, thanks everybody for coming out. So exciting to see so many of you come and, and hear about open search. Uh, in this session, we're going to focus in on search and how search works, and especially the role of language in both capturing information and in finding uh, that information. So, you know, if we, we can go all the way back to Mesopotamia, to ancient Sumer, where the bureaucrats were capturing information uh, onto their clay tablets, right? And they would, uh, along with those clay tablets, they needed indexes to keep track of their clay tablets. Uh, a little bit later in time, uh, in the Library of Alexandria, we had Callimachus, was an ancient scholar. Callimachus created scrolls that mapped uh, the scrolls that were in the library. More recent times, we have uh, libraries and a whole science that developed around how do we capture the information that we have in the library and created these big card catalogs. I don't know if anybody in the, uh, in the audience has actually used one of these card catalogs, uh, but they're you know, these enormous uh, drawers full of pieces of paper, little index cards that tell you where to go find the information you need. And actually, they're built by librarians. And in, some, in a lot of cases, I don't know if you ever did this, but you go to the library, you ask the librarian, like, how do I go to the card catalog? How do I find what I need? So, you know, information and the capture of information and then the cataloging of that information have been around since there has been information, right? Lately, as we all know, um, Gen AI, there's a, you know, a big boom in Gen AI. And fundamentally, what it's, what's driving it are large language models that can, again, capture in an information system the information uh, and the meaning and the semantics around what is the information uh, in that, uh, in that what, what is the information? And this is supporting even uh, conversational models where we're talking to our documents, thanks to our friends uh, at Adobe. I think it's a super interesting use case where you have a document and you, you can actually co converse with it. And along with that, people are searching in a little bit of a different way, right? So, I was out to dinner with a friend, uh, we were talking, and there was a moment where usually we would go to Google. And in this case, we opened you know, ChatGPT and we asked a question. So there's a different model even of searching that's coming to the fore. So we're, you know, we're headed in a direction where we used to have the, the 10 blue links. You'd go to Google, put a search in, you'd get 10 blue links, and that was the the sort of paradigm of searching. I think that use case stays for a long time. There's an, an exact search which is really necessary and we're gonna to continue to have. But we're moving into a world where finding information is really more conversational and less about one shot matching, less about uh, I'm just gonna type some words and I'm gonna go in and, and get an answer. So for all of this, again, language is how we mediate with the search engine. And so let's look at first how this is solved lexically before we move into vectors. So lexical search is about decomposing the language that describes or is part of some document in order for you to be able to find it with the goal of matching, right? So when I go to a search engine, I have some information goal. I want to find uh, you know, a particular part for, to fix my sink, or uh, I want to find a flight to India so I can present at OpenSearchCon, right? I have an information goal. My means of specifying my goal is textual. I can type into a text box. Um, we have faceting now. This is a UI component that enables me to drill in and say, hey, United Airlines only, or whatever. Um, also, I have geolocation. That can be part of my query. You know, I want to fly San Francisco to Bangalore, right? Open Search's job is to take that information, that language, match it to a catalog of information that it has, and retrieve to me a ranked set of results that solves my information goal. So how do we do this? With Open Search, we create documents, which are JSON documents. This is an example from the Amazon product Q&A data set. Um, this particular one is a t-shirt. You can see we have some question text, the category, 
a question type, some answers, we have chunks, we have product descriptions. So this is all of the text that comprises the description or the information that is in this document. The first thing that we do is we analyze that text. And in lexical search, and, and indeed for decades, we've been working on means of pulling semantic information through this process of text analysis, right? To analyze the text, this is Miss Kobayashi's dragon maid Toru cosplay dress outfit. Um, what I need to do is apply a set of rules that again bring out some of the semantics of this piece of text. So in this case, you know, there are a few common tools. Uh, one of those is to apply language-based stemming. What stemming does is it reduces words to a common uh, base stem. So things like run, runs, running will stem to run. And the, the insight there is that all of those words mean the same thing, and the stem form gives me that, that compact piece of meaning. Second thing is we remove stop words. So stop words are very common words, like in English, a, an, the. Those words don't provide a lot of value in, in terms of matching. So we remove those. And then we can add synonyms. Synonyms are words that have the same meaning. And in adding synonyms, again, we're, we're bringing more meaning to the text in order to be able to match more queries that mean that thing, right? And I have the analyzed version on the right. You'll see it's uh, done a lot of the stemming. It looks a little bit weird because of how the stemmer works. Um, but this is the actual text that's available to me for matching. So these all work at the single token level. And again, they improve the meaning or to the capture of the meaning of these words. In Open Search is uh, based on Lucene. Apache Lucene is a Java library that reads and writes search indices. So Lucene maps all of the terms in my document to the set of documents that contain those terms. Uh, we pass the document fields through analysis, as we've described, and then we collect a set of terms. These are all the words that appear in that set of text. Each word points at what we call posting list. Posting list is the set of documents that contain those terms. For lexical search, uh, we can do something like this. This is a query, we say multi-match, cotton washable clothes in the bullets and the product description, the item name, and we want to do and. And I have two examples here. There's the Miss Kobayashi cosplay dress and a very soft silicon vinyl. Um, this is a stuffed animal. Okay, so these are my two examples. If I'm searching for cotton washable clothes, I expect to find number 22. So the first thing we do is we analyze the query. So we say cotton washable clothes, we apply stemming, stop words, synonyms, we come out cotton washable cloth. We then match the terms in the query and retrieve the posting lists. So you can see I have an example index on the bottom left that contains terms like Canva, cloth, cotton, grade, park, et cetera, with their posting lists. I pull the posting lists for cotton, washable, clothes, cloth because of the stemming. I then apply a merge to merge together all of these posting lists, right? And I come up with 38. Not actually the right answer, but we don't generally use an intersection for this reason. Instead, we use a union. We say cotton or washable or cloth. And then we use ranking to sort and retrieve the correct thing at the top of the results. So if I do an or, then I get the union of all of those sets of data. And that includes 22. And again, the ranking is the thing that we uh, use to discriminate between the different po potential answers. Open Search is, uses OKP BM25 as a ranking algorithm. This is one of a set of algorithms called TF-IDF. That is term frequency, inverse document frequency. I won't go into depth on this. There's a number of different pieces here. Um, the inverse document frequency, the idea is that the more rare a word is, the more valuable it is as a match. If I match a very rare word, probably that's important. Um, then I look at how many times it occurs in the document I'm scoring, and the score gets bigger for those occurrences. And it's really probabilistic. Uh, we have additional terms for 
uh, terms in the formula for saturation and document length, number of things we do there. But it's really probabilistic, and again, the meaning is only captured through how rare or common a term is. So we have a, a, this kind of one-shot uh, matching model based on this lexical search where we'll go type some things, we'll see some search results, and then hopefully I get the right results. If I don't get the right results, then I try some different words. Or, you know, I iterate my query to try to come up with the right set of results. At some point, I get frustrated, I give up, right? This is, this is kind of where the state of the world was five years ago. So now we're gonna move into uh, what happens with vectors, how do they work, and how do they improve this scenario? So first thing is, what are vectors, right? Everybody talks about LLMs, LLMs generate vectors, vectors are this cool thing. What are vectors, and how do they work? Large language models, what some of them do, is take in pieces of text and emit these multi-dimensional multi vectors that capture the meaning or the, the, the meaning behind that text. So what is a vector? Everybody remember what is a vector? A vector is a quantity with a magnitude and a direction, right? Two dimensions, you can represent a vector on a Cartesian axis with, uh, in this case, the x-axis has a value four, the y-axis has a value six. That's the vector centered at the origin uh, there. The two directions can mean anything. Like X, for instance, could be uh, apples. Y could be oranges. So if I try to represent the concept apple, I'll have you know, X equals one and Y equals zero. And actually, this is uh, one of the ways that machine learning has worked with language uh, prior to LLMs. So this, one is, this is called one-hot coding where every word has a single uh, one in one of the dimensions, right? So in this case, apple is one comma zero, zero, zero. Uh, aardvark is zero, one, zero, 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 right? So we represent every word in the vocabulary. If the vocabulary is one million different words, then the vector is one million long, right? But the generalization there, uh, sorry, the generalization there is limited, right? If I try to say red plus fruit, that doesn't mean anything. The vector red plus the vector fruit has two ones in it, that's not a valid uh, vector, right? So what we do and what Open Search provides in terms of sparse coding is we collapse the vocabulary from one million words down to something like 30,000 words. And we use LLMs that generate these sparse vectors to do that collapse. We collapse in such a way that related concepts are, have high values in some of the dimensions and unrelated concepts have zeros. So the vectors are mostly zero. It's a little bit of a step from the one hot. The vectors are mostly zero and the tokens are associated with them. But they're not real tokens, right? They're not really the words. You can see, uh, this is an example of a sparse vector. I have you know, the two ha uh, hashtags, hashtag, hashtag, ED. This is one of these collapsed vectors, right, or collapsed terms. But there are some terms in there, like found, best, men, black, blah, blah, blah. This enables us to collapse the query in a similar way into a similar set of tokens and match those tokens and then do a dot product for the vector match. So sparse is one step along uh, the dimension. Dense coding goes a further step where the axes themselves are not particularly related to terms. What the LLM learns on each of, is, on each of these axes is how to project the, me, the values, the words, into this space, which is defined by typically 384, 768, uh, 1,536, some number of dimensions, some number of axes, the LLM goes through a process of fitting so that the axes themselves become essentially the concepts, and this enables us uh, to do more generalization, right? So uh, if the y-axis is red, the x-axis is fruit, red plus fruit equals apple, this, this kind of gives us the, an idea about how they generalize.
right? Um, each dimension adds additional capacity for representing concepts. So neural nets with backpropagation go learn these axes, right? This is an example here of a dense vector. Just to demystify, this is not, this is not crazy, it's just a big floating point array that represents some concept. We do get good generalization with this, but we get hallucinations. And hallucinations are when you, know, you ask a chatbot to please generate some text, chatbot generates something that sounds good, but it's actually totally wrong. And the, the function for representing these is complex, right? So these models need to have parameters in their function that enables them to project the values, right? Um, a simple linear function in n dimensions looks like this. These functions are actually much more complicated and they need tens of billions of parameters. And this is one of the ways that we're improving the LLMs is by increasing the amount of parameterization. So we get more complex surfaces to represent language. Uh, just to really go through and again, demystify a little bit, uh, a model is simply a mapping of an input to an output. We have embedding models. Embedding models generate vectors from text. Those are different from, well, foundation models are models that are canned and trained on uh, large amounts of text. Multimodal models are models that work with images, text, sometimes video, sometimes other media. Um, and I wanted to sort of just discriminate the embedding generation from text generation. It's the same idea, except instead of generating a, tech, a vector embedding, the LLM can generate an actual text response. And so when we do chatbots, these are text generation models. <clears throat> so this is how vectors work and how they capture language. So let's talk about how we use that in search. We have some new paradigms in searching. So we talked about sparse. Sparse actually uh, brings a union of the generalization of dense vectors along with some of the precision of, uh, of token to token, of lexical, right? So sparse models actually provide a, a benefit over just dense models if you're doing search. Multimodal is a way, again, of broadening the window of my ability to specify what is my information goal at this moment? What am I searching for? Why am I searching for it? Hybrid brings a lexical match and a, a vector match and then can combine the scores so that, again, you get a little bit of best of both worlds. You get a lexical uh, score and a lexical ranking. You get a vector score and a vector ranking. Uh, Open Search can combine those again, to give you best of both worlds. And then finally, generative AI is a broad term that everybody's using, but refers to specifically generating textual responses. And so in the search context, generative AI really is how we do uh, chatbots uh, that enable me to talk to my data, again, like Adobe. Um, we talked a lot about sort of similar, well, we talked about generating text. So how do we decide that things are similar, right? In the text-to-text -text matching, we have uh, BM25, and really that is looking at the TF-IDF and how the words come together. In the, in the vector world, we use the space defined by the number of dimensions, just like the Cartesian two-dimensional space, to find close neighbors that represent similar, similar sets of concepts. And then we also like to bring user behavior. We won't touch on user behavior in this talk, although there's a talk later on user behavior insights, which is coming to open search. Um, we use user behavior either to help define how to personalize for a particular searcher or how to characterize the documents themselves. Uh, as I mentioned, we create a space, and this is just a way to visualize. The points in the space each represent some document, something that I'm searching for potentially. Um, nearest neighbors there then are related concepts, and we use those to dig them out. In Open Search, we have the neural plugin. The neural plugin helps with matching and scoring vectors, and generating matching and scoring vectors. Uh, Open Search does provide con a connector uh, framework that enables you to connect to third-party models externally, 
And those third-party models will either generate vector embeddings, uh, well, will generate vector embeddings. On the indexing side, when you do vector search, you take your search document, frequently you'll, you'll break it into chunks. Again, uh, as we heard from Adobe, if it's a very large document, it's not very useful like, to match some particular language. You need a smaller piece of that document that is much more specific to what you're searching for. So there's a process of chunking and taking out smaller pieces of text to generate vector embeddings. Uh, you send them off to some vector embedding uh, model and you augment your document with those embeddings and you send that off to a K nearest neighbor index. On the search side, you need to do the same thing. You need to take your query, send it off to the embedding model, generate an embedding for that query, and then use the K nearest neighbor search to generate the results. The neural plugin automates a couple of the steps here. So neural plugin will on the ingest side send off to the third party model host on the query side, uh, we'll send off the query for embedding. We support all of this through pipelines. On the ingest side, you create an ingest pipeline. Here we have an ingest pipeline that has a set of processors, just one in this case. It takes a model ID that's provided by the connector framework, and then you provide a field map that says, take this text field, generate the vector via this model, and put it into this other field. On the query side, we have a number of different ways that you can query with Neural Plugin. Uh, in this, they all, again, use pipelines. And I create a pipeline that has a set of processors. Uh, in this case, I'm using a normalization processor. This is for a hybrid search that enables me to combine two subqueries with the weights provided. When I run this query, I'll run it through this pipeline, uh, and Open Search will automatically do the two different queries and do the score normalization and combine the results. So some of the ways that you use open search to search, uh, we have a semantic search. Here on the ingest side, uh, we have this ingest pipeline. It takes a model ID, uh, maps the chunk to the chunk embedding. And on the query side, we use, say, a neural query uh, against the chunk embedding field. We provide the query text. We provide the model ID. Again, open search will go and generate the vector embedding for that, run the query with nearest neighbor, and then uh, provide me the results. For sparse search, on the ingest pipeline side, it looks very similar. We just have a model that generates sparse vectors, just like we saw. Um, we then have, in the index, we define the field to be of type rank features. This is the way that open search can latch into those sparse uh, vectors. We, for a query, again, we query against the particular field, uh, give it a model ID, and it's as simple as that. Open search does the rest. So with sparse vectors, actually they're more performant in terms of latency and also require much less RAM. Um, the matching function is just a dot product uh, between the retrieved documents and the query vector itself, right? So it's a faster ranking, um, uses less RAM also. We see some pretty good improvements on standardized tests like BEIR, um, 10 to 17% improvement uh, against just uh, BM25, and a 14% improvement over dense vector, right? So sparse vector can actually uh, do quite well. We talked about hybrid search in this case to implement I have a, a search pipeline that is going to combine two queries with the weights provided. Uh, on the query side, then I have the two queries in the hybrid query type. The top query is just doing a text match. The bottom query is a neural query with an embedding. Again, Open Search will run these two queries, combine the scores uh, according to how I set up the weights. If we look at uh, this transformer plus lexical, you can see we have a number of improvements um, against a number of different standard corpora. So NF corpus, track COVID, Arguna, et cetera. We have a BM25 score, a harmonic mean score, an arithmetic mean score. There are different ways that you can combine these results. Ultimately, we get again a 14 or 15% improvement 
uh, in recall. And then just multimodal search. Uh, on the ingest side, we're going to specify a field map that gives a text and an image. Uh, we provide the text and the image as input. Uh, when we query, we query with a model ID uh, and we add text and image, right? This, uh, this is how all of this works. Just very quickly, um, we'll hear a lot more about generative AI, but open search plays a role in generati generative AI. It does not generate text. It provides a reduction in hallucinations. So the usual way to use it, the input comes, I'm going to, to my application. My application goes and queries open search uh, to bring back relevant information to augment the user prompt and then run the query and respond with text. Um, we do have a playground, mlplayground.opensearch.org. Uh, I recommend that you go check it out. All of these different query types are there. You can play with them. Uh, you can do your input. Also, I wrote all this stuff down. Uh, we have a little booklet. I'll be sitting out there. We'll be handing out the booklet uh, for anybody who wants. It's free. Uh, and so uh, please come check that out. So just to wrap, it's all about language. It's always been about language, capturing information, specifying a query, relating the query to the information. And improvements in natural language processing have made it easier for us to capture the meaning and to respond to queries based on meaning. And so how you interact with your information, both in the enterprise and in the real world, is changing, it's shifting. We're at a, a kind of inflection point in the search world. Uh, so that's, all, that's what I have, thank you very much. I want to bring up uh, Sai, who is a principal engineer at Intuit. Hey, thanks, John. That was a lot of detail, and like uh, it gives a lot of intuition of uh, why we do it in what we do at uh, Open Search. Uh, my name is Sai. I'm a principal engineer at Intuit. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how we are using like, open search vector capabilities to improve our search at Intuit. Uh, Intuit, we are a fintech company. Our mission is about powering prosperity around the world. Uh, some of our most important products, right? Uh, QuickBooks and MailChimp uh, serves in the areas of uh, self-employed and uh, small business areas. We also have like uh, TurboTax and Credit Karma, these serves our individual customers. Uh, at Intuit, right, we do ton of AI with a uh, lot of uh, data. So in the last one year, at Intuit, we have developed something called uh, GenOS capability, which is a platform capability for building generative AI models uh, for our users. So we built something called Intuit Assist. Uh, it's a financial assistant uh, for giving smart recommendations to our users. So behind the scenes, right, Intuit Assist leverages the power of uh, uh, large LLM models. Uh, and we all know that like, whenever we use LLMs, right, we have a lot of hallucinations. So this is where like, uh, vector search at Intuit comes into picture. So I want to talk about like, three fundamental use cases of how we are using vector search at Intuit. So the first use case, right? Like uh, we have a lot of Gen AI applications where like which powers question and answer applications. These have a lot of hallucinations and another disadvantage with this uh, question and answer applications, right? They don't have latest information about the users. So our vector search, right? It helps in reducing the hallucinations and also provide the latest information to the LLM to generate the right answers. And the second set of use cases, right? It's something called like. Uh, around semantic search. So in our QuickBook products, right, we have various use cases where uh, our users, right, they bring in, they bring in their own uh, product catalog, which has to be matched with uh, QuickBook's inventory catalog. And based on this product match, right, we create entries in our accounting books. Uh, and another use case around semantic match, matching, right, uh, which is like identity resolution. Uh, at Intuit, we have multiple software products. If a user logs into our Credit Karma site, right, uh, we want to ensure that the same credentials, when the user logs into TurboTax, we reuse them. So behind the scenes, what we do, right, we take the identity of the Credit Karma user and match it with TurboTax identity profiles. And then the user will be able to seamlessly log in across our products. Uh, 
And the third important use case with the vector search, right, is uh, document discovery. At Intuit, our users upload tons of uh, tax documents and invoices. So where we leverage vector search, right, given a user's document, we need to match millions of documents in the S3 blob store and then bringing the document that, that is most relevant and extract the information out of it. Yeah. So these are the main use cases of uh, vector search at Intuit. Now I'm going to talk about uh, what our team does. Uh, we are like Intuit Persistent Service. It's a platform team at Intuit. Uh, we help in like creating and managing transactional data stores for your applications at Intuit. So what we do in IPS is, right, Think of us as a database as a service for various kind of transactional stores like NoSQL, search, relational, and graph databases. Uh, what we abstract out for the users, right? Uh, people don't have the complexity of choosing a data store. Or like we also manage uh, how do you provision, how, how do you scale, and manage the databases behind the scenes. Uh, so at IPS, right, we started with uh, IPS search f five years back. We have a lot of uh, uh, use cases around traditional search. In the last two, three years, right, we started like vector search. And we also been like partnering with our AI and feature management platform teams uh, to build a paved path solution for our question and answer applications uh, with RAG architecture. So multiple teams at Intuit, right, can onboard to our uh, question and answer uh, as self service and build question and answer applications with ease. So now I'm, I want to talk about like a typical journey of like how do people, uh, our internal customers onboard to IPS vector search. The first option, right? People come via the RAG uh, paved path for GenOS. This paved path is mainly used for all the users who wants to create generative AI applications. And here we are leveraging uh, our vector database for creating a knowledge base. And the second set of use case, right? People onboard to uh, IPS vector through traditional sources like in dev portal. So this is for all the traditional use case around uh, semantic search around like product matching, identity matching, recommendations, and fraud detection. So these are the two ways people come and uh, build the vector database at Intuit. All right. So now I want to give a small intuition about like, uh, I think like John has, a uh, lot of people have spoken about this, but let me double down on this. So. One of the traditional use cases is like keyword search or lexical search. So we typically use this if, like, if you know exactly what you're looking for, right? This is the way to go. Uh, for example, right? If I have to do something like an exact keyword or a wildcard search or a combination of fuzzy search, right? Or you are using all three combinations of these. So this is where you use the classic uh, keyword search, which leverages uh, TF-IDF algorithms behind the scenes. Uh, the shortcoming of this, right, this doesn't, this only looks at the exact matches of the user uh, search. We are not looking at the intent. For all the use cases where we need to understand the intent of the user and then give answers that match the user's intent, this is where semantic search in comes into picture. Uh, so earlier I spoke about like product matching and identity resolution. These are classic uh, semantic search use cases at Intuit. So if somebody searches in Amazon.in, right, uh, give me kitchen items. So now you need to bring in nonstick pans and microwaves. So because like this is the actual results understanding the intent of the user, right? Right. Uh, so now I want to explain uh, deep dive into one of the use cases of vector search, right? How are we using vector searches for uh, building knowledge bases for our question and answer applications? Uh, so when an uh, user is building in a question and answer system, right? So we bring in all the documents related to that particular application, you put it in an S3 bucket. And then you come to our, uh, our AI market app, you specify the location of this S3 bucket. And then our next is our AI service will look at all these parts to all these documents, chunk these documents into multiple pieces, and then publish as events into Kafka topic. And then our IPS ingester picks up each of these uh, chunks, and then it calls an embedding model generates the vector, and then inserts the vector as a dense vector in the open search cluster along with the total document. Now when a user searches some question, right? 
Now we go through the same vector embedding, generate the vector. Now this vector is again searched in the open search cluster, retrieve the most common matching documents, and then using these documents from the uh, search store, we ask the LLM, new prompt, hey, can you use these uh, relevant documents and then answer the user's query? So usually like this helps in reducing hallucinations, and most importantly, you have the latest user about the user. So whenever people are asking about what is my uh, cash flow look, uh, look like in this month. So you need all the last one month transactions to answer these kind of questions actually. So this is where like, you need latest information about the user uh, to give relevant answers in question answer applications. So this is the same architecture for the, the earlier use case what I'm talking about. Here I want to highlight two specific things. One is like how we are generating embedded models using open search. So we use two specific ways to do this. One is like uh, the neural plugin, where like if my embedding models are deployed within open search, right, I'll always register this uh, embedding models, then I get a model ID. Then when I'm ingesting and also in the search query, right, I can give the model ID and open search internally creates the vector. I don't have to do anything additional. And the second way we create the embeddings, right, is using ML connectors. So where the embedding model could be deployed outside of open search cluster, and then we give the API signature and also the authentication details to the ML connector, and then that does all the orchestration, fetches the embeddings, and then puts it in the open search cluster. So here in the uh, user app query, right, whenever the user gives the query, it goes through the same embedding model, we get the vector, and then the matching node DSL, right, it's nothing but it is generating like semantic search queries on the open search cluster, gets the very relevant documents, then giving to the uh, LLM node, which calls the OpenAI models uh, with the latest information about the user, and then we get the best prompts for the best results for our uh, Q&A applications. So now I want to deep dive and give us a typical journey and some of the best practices, what we have done at uh, Intuit to leverage the power of open search. So this is the first developer journey where like, we define a standard schema. Uh, and this schema is mapped into, an, uh, because we manage all multiple databases, right? we have one language called PSL language, where our developers mention their language uh, schema. This is converted to open search mapping. The most important thing is, look at on the right hand side. Now when I'm doing a vector search, right, we have lots of bells and whistles here. So we, we can provide what is the vector size, what kind of engine to use, what is my uh, the vector search algorithm? Can I use HNSW or uh, IVF algorithm? And also we have various, we can plug in what kind of similarity algorithms you can use. And also very specific techniques of how are you indexing these vectors? Uh, so we have various parameters to tweak to how we construct the vector indices, which gives us a control over the accuracy and also the indexing latency. So now our users publish these documents, and using the embedding model, we create the vectors and insert into Elastic uh, Open Search. Uh, now this is simple read query. So on the left hand side, we have uh, user is giving the vector, and also like you are doing a KNN search. Uh, right? This is the very simple K vector search. Now the right hand side is more interesting. So we all experience that whenever there are millions of documents, right? Uh, the latency for a vector search usually goes about a second or higher. Now, one way to reduce this is right using power of pre-filtering. So, what pre-filter does, right? This is classic uh, open search concepts where you're reducing the search space, and then in the reduced search space, right, fewer documents, you're then doing vector search. So, this reduces the usually latency to about sub 200, 300 milliseconds. So John also spoke about hybrid query, right? Th this helps us a lot in increasing. I want to double down on this, actually. So here, what we do, right? You use the power of both traditional search as well as the vector search here. Uh, now in the new, uh, so you're doing the semantic search using the, uh, uh, the neural plugin. If you observe in the bottom part, right? Uh, you see there is a model ID. So what I'm doing is I'm giving a text and using the model ID, open search is automatically creating the vector and doing the vector search. 
And now on the left hand side, I'm, I'm mentioning like, how do I compare, combine these scores? The first thing what we do, right? Uh, you normalize this course to a score of uh, 0 to 1, and then you can combine these two scores based on the weights. So we are using 0.3 weightage to the traditional match and 0.7 to the semantic uh, search. And this helps us increasing our uh, search accuracy significantly. Uh, in this slide, right, I want to talk about what is the power of open search. So we have a lot of flexibility in like, uh, mentioning what kind of uh, uh, engines to use. You could use Lucene, Fias, or NSWLib. Uh, in, the, in the end of this slide, right, I'll tell when to use what. So you also have a lot of flexibility around like what kind of vector indexing to use, uh, whether to use HNSW algorithm or IVF, and like what kind of vector embedding models to use, and also size of the vector right, also plays in, uh, in part of the, about the accuracy. And you can also tweak parameters like M and EF underscore construction parameters. These play a key role whenever you are using the uh, vector search algorithm like HNSW, right? Like how fast you create the vector index and what's your accuracy. And finally, you can have like plethora of uh, similarity algorithms with your vectors. So now, when to choose what? So typically, whenever you're doing a uh, vector search, right? I would say there are four factors which are very critical for us. One is like, what is the latency you're expecting for your query? What kind of accuracy you're looking for your query? And what kind of memory footprint and the indexing latency? I think like Adobe, they were very much optimizing on the indexing aspect. So based upon what, what you want to optimize in one of these four factors, right? You pick and choose between the indexing strategy, the vector search algorithms, and also the parameters that goes into constructing this uh, uh, vector search algorithms. Uh, so I also want to talk about some of our learnings at Intuit with our experience in vector search. Uh, the first thing what I would suggest is, if your accuracy is not very high, right, try different embedding algorithms. Different embedding algorithms, so because ultimately you're comparing vectors, right? Uh, the some vector by embedding algorithm suits your data sets than others, actually. So I would experiment with that. And one proven technique is always using a combination of uh, text search and uh, semantic search rate always increases the accuracy because you're getting the best of both the worlds. Uh, another trick, right? Always train your model with a golden data set. So the reason why we do this at Intuit, right? Because with a golden set, right, you always know what are good results and what are bad results. So this way, you can always tune your algorithms and engines and uh, all permutations, combinations, and see like what's working and what's not working. Because golden set, you understand very well like what's the right result and what's not the right result, right? Uh, and another thing if you're using is like uh, an algorithm like HNSW, right? There are a lot of tweaks to, to tweak around the parameters like M and EF, right? So have a balance between accuracy as well as the latency. So strike the right balance, that's what I would suggest. And finally, if you want very high accuracy and also with less memory, right? Always use efficient compression techniques. Uh, so one thing is to use product quantizations and also we have something called scalar quantization. Uh, scalar quantization. Uh, product quantization is a little harder to use at this point of time with open search. Uh, it needs a lot of training actually. However, if you do scalar quantizations, right? Uh, the loss is very limited and, and the memory footprint reduces by half actually. Uh, so finally, I want to talk about like some of the search metrics. Uh, I want to highlight two specific use cases. Uh, so the first use case, right? So this is about for our uh, uh, question and answer applications using Gen AI models. So we index bursts of 30k documents per second. So the reason why this happens, right? People put tons of documents in S3 and then right away our indexing starts. So we have about more than 40,000 queries per second. Uh, the ingested data about this document is like, because these documents are all internal documents, right? It's about 10 GB documents. And then when we are chunking, the total documents in the open search cluster is about few million documents. So it's about reasonable size. So we have 10 use cases in production. And typically, the accuracy with this, right, we are running around 80% accuracy on our uh, final results, actually. Uh, the second use case I want to talk is, uh, is on the lines of semantic search. 
where like our customers, right, they upload more than 4 million documents uh, every year. And all of this, right, uh, we create vectors out of this, and then we do some kind of uh, product categorization using vector search. Uh, so we, we, we get about 5,000 search queries per second, and the total document data is about 250 GB. Yeah. So a couple of asks for, like, we, have, we closely work with uh, Open Search at Intuit. What we are looking forward is like uh, better compression techniques on the product quantization. And also today, right, uh, th the memory footprint, whatever we use, is like it's predominantly we are, it is powered by RAM. Now we are looking at, we are partnering with Open Search to reduce the memory footprint where like you could use a combination of SSDs, hard drives along with RAM. So as uh, earlier one of the speakers was saying with Adobe, right, in big companies, cost is a very important factor. Even with accuracy and speed, right, cost does play a factor. So we try always what, like to reduce the cost. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.